Okay, good evening and welcome. It is November 2nd, 2020. This is the regularly scheduled school committee meeting. I'll call the meeting to order. It is 6 p.m. This meeting is being held remotely in accordance with the Governor of Massachusetts March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. We'll uh, state that the full committee is in attendance this evening and uh, we will move on to our first order of business, which is approval of minutes. If I have a motion, please. Move to approve the October 5th executive session meeting minutes. Motion made by Bill. I'll second. Second by Beth, discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. That carries five to zero. Next. Approval. I move to approve the October 5th regular session meeting minutes. Motion made by Bill. Second. Second by Sarah. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. <coughs> Carries five to zero. Next. Move to approve the October 19th, 2020 exec executive session meeting minutes. Motion made by Bill. Second. Second by Antonella. Discussion. <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. And the final one, please. All right. Move to approve the October 19th, 2020 regular session meeting minutes. Motion made by Bill. Second. Second by Beth. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. Okay, moving right along, we have an opportunity for visitors to address the committee. If there's anyone out there who would like to make a statement to the committee, now would be the time. If you can just raise your hand. I have one hand, Greg. Outlet, we can bring her in, please. Hello, Crystal. Give her a minute. Yep. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much. Uh, yes. My name is Crystal and I'm from East Long Meadow, uh, Johnson, Two Peach Tree. And I have children in the East Long Meadow school system. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of a large group and growing numbers of families in town that feel right now um, to choose for their kids, like children to go to school to learn in person. Three members of our group have posted questions in the last two school committee meetings and only one which was answered. We have several questions, but we would like to focus on the matrix. What matrix or qualifiable data are being used to determine the potential reopening of the schools? Commissioner Riley has changed the guidelines to say schools should stay open if they are in the red, but no cases are in the school. If we are in the red in January 15th, but there are no cases in the school, will you reopen? Yeah, Crystal, we, we're going to specifically address that question um, in our uh, update this evening. Is there anything else you want to state for the record? Well, the school committee has just not provided any response um, to barely any questions or concerns about the remainder of the school year, and many families feel left in the dark. It was mentioned at the last meeting about trying to be more transparent, and going forward, how do you plan on creating better communication and transparency with parents? And again, what metrics are being determined to reopen? I think we're all just really concerned about having the choice to send. I think when you look at the amount of people that are looking for outside schools that are opening, for example, you know, from the high school like Pope Francis or Wilbraham Munson Academy, we have people in our town that are just choosing to send their kids to private schools based off the fact that they have the option to go. And I think that's diverting a lot of the attention that we need to put into the high school, getting a new high school. If these kids are commuting to different schools, we're not going to be able to pass that going forward. And also that, what is it doing to their social development? I mean, I have a five-year-old, I have a 16-year-old, and I have a 14-year-old. So I speak at all different levels for the connection. And we have some really amazing teachers out there. I mean, my five-year-old kindergarten teacher is wonderful but I have to tell you it breaks my heart to sit there and listen to my five-year-old raise his hand or try to get across and then rate the call a zero because he says he didn't get to talk to any of his friends um, you know struggling with 
putting together sentences or words. And that's something that he would get in school. And, you know, he's not getting that because I don't hear it. Um, I'm his mom. So obviously I understand the things that he's saying. So, I mean, there's just all different levels that we're, we're worried about. And I just feel like there's not a lot of transparency coming from it when it's coming to like, why are other schools trying things? I mean, Summers has been open in Connecticut. My sister's kids go there. They've been open the entire time on a hybrid basis and then on now the back to a permanent basis. And I just don't understand why we're not trying. Okay, Crystal, thank you for your input this evening. Um, we'll uh, do our best to answer some of those questions later on tonight. Thank um, you very much. Thank you for your time, Crystal. Catherine, we have uh, another one, uh, Don. Catherine, dog in, please. Hello, Catherine. Uh, my name's Catherine. I'm at nine Shaw Street, and my kiddo is in fourth grade over at Maple Shade. Um, and I just, I, I am just one, I have three things quickly to say. Um, this is really working. I'm amazed. I've been just very impressed by how remote education is working. Um, my kid actually like misses school on the weekend like she used to in person. I, it's, it's, it's incredible. Second, um, I, as the cases are just like ticking up, you know, we're getting these emergency alerts. I love knowing what we're doing for school tomorrow. Like the lack of disruption is absolutely incredible. I'm a professor at Springfield College. We just recently shut down. Everything is going fully remote. I mean, those kids are in absolute disarray as are their professors. Uh, last thing I wanna say is I've heard you in previous meetings talk about sending out a parent survey. Um, and I just, I want to, um, <laughs> I affirm that it's really hard to write surveys. I'm a qualitative researcher. Um, but y'all, that survey was confusing and I'm like a super well-educated native English speaker and I could not, I'm sorry, I couldn't figure out what you were saying. Um, so just a, a urge um, the way that survey is being used, the data is being used from it doesn't represent the way I was interpreting the question. So just uh, a friendly urge to, um, uh, to make sure that the survey questions are like super crystal clear. So thank you for all of your work on this. Thanks for standing firm in your decisions. Um, I know this is all really hard and terrible. Um, and I really appreciate that you all have made such a, what I think a great decision. So thank you for your, um, your hard work. Okay, Catherine, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, we have learned uh, a little bit about asking survey questions and um, we'll certainly be cognizant of it. Um, to ask the question that we're looking for the answer for. So thank you for pointing that out. Okay, uh, seeing no further hands, we will move on with our agenda this evening. And we're gonna move forward with uh, committee and subcommittee communications. Does everyone, anyone in the committee have anything they'd like to discuss? No, everybody's good? Okay, good to hear. So we will move on. We're going to talk about our FY uh, fiscal year 21 capital projects and we're going to prioritize them within the five year capital plan. So in your packets, you have um, last year's prioritization list of projects along with the two that were picked up in this fiscal year's capital budget. And that was the um, second phase of the steam piping replacement at Maple Shade and the electrical switch gear and distribution panels at the high school. Uh, looking at last year's prioritization, the one that would move up if you're keeping them in the same order would be Mountain View's um, replacement of their two portable modular trailer classrooms and replace that hopefully similarly to what we did over at Meadowbrook where um, we were able to go from modular construction to actual stick built or traditional construction. Gordon, do we know the specific um, by school rankings that the administrators might have? Any idea so on those? The spreadsheet is actually set up in, um, by the way the schools are ranking them. And um, then last year's prioritization list was how eventually the school committee ranked them. So okay. if you look, um, Meadowbrook 
is looking at their parking lot redesign. Um, going down Maple Shade, I uh, would like to finalize what they're doing with their doors. The door project um, has been in phases and the last phase covered uh, a few exterior doors, but really uh, set up their lobby, if you will, um, in a much better way. If we ever had to go to full lockdown, you can isolate someone now in the lobby because the cafeteria locks, the, the uh, gymnasium locks, and the front office there would lock. And so basically those doors could close and you, um, sad to be thinking this way, but you would trap an intruder right there while protecting everybody else. Um, as you yep. continue down, we just talked about Mountain Views um, modulars and then um, Birchland was looking at, uh, it's amazing to think that Birchland's now a um, 20 year old building, but um, they're looking at carpet replacement in their library and computer labs and course room. The high school, most of the projects would be picked up um, if we continue with the MSBA, which um, I know all of you are in favor of, as am I, and hopefully the public will also continue to be in favor of. We'd be picking up most of those projects in a comprehensive project. And what we're trying to do is similar to the switch uh, replacement and the panel replacement is just make sure we're keeping the building up in a situation where um, we can utilize it and obviously keep it as a um, instructional environment as well as um, extracurricular and co-curricular activities and so forth. Okay, so in order to prioritize, I would say typically we try to touch each of the buildings at least in the first go round. Um, so if the administrators have already prioritized their number one, then I would say we should probably follow the same idea. So if we take the Meadowbrook parking lot redesign, the Maple Shade exterior door replacement, the Birchland Park uh, carpet replacement, and then the track, uh, Gordon, we were looking to do community preservation. Are we going to still ask, uh, do, or do we still want to leave it on the capital planning list until it's accepted? I would leave it on the capital plan. Um, yeah. So the application to community preservation is into that committee. I know that they reviewed it once. I have not heard whether um, we're going to be invited in to present or where that is, but I can check on that. But <laughs> Um, there's no guarantee that it's going to come through community preservation, right. so it'd be wise to leave it on. So again, in years past, we've typically have left the high school projects. Um, as Mr. Smith alluded to, that these would potentially be picked up in a comprehensive project. So we have them on there to demonstrate that there's clearly a need for projects to be done. If you look at this year alone, it's... Um, over $5 million that we would be requesting if not for a new building. So if we leave those aside um, and potentially, I would recommend we go with the uh, Birchland Park carpet replacement probably as one, and then the uh, parking lot redesign is two, Meadowbrook maple shade exterior doors is three. Are you, are you putting um, Mountain Views modulars as one? Well, just because of the dollar amount, because mm -hmm. we strategically sometimes try to place things, I would put that more in as a four or five, personally, in terms of historically, we're funded about half a million dollars in projects in order to- I think it's to gonna be tough to get any money this year, so that might be wise. Yeah, no, that one, typically, I would say that one would be a bonding event anyway. So it's whether yeah, or not- you, you could. Bond. So following that, um, that line of thinking, I, I think you could still leave it at one for the urgency. Um, and they may, you know, as they go through capital planning, look to some of the smaller items anyway. Okay. I'm just okay with that. Yeah, just a thought. I mean, they, it's been two for a number of years um, yep. and has not been picked up where others down the list have been picked up. All right. So let's do that first then. We'll do the, uh, the re two classroom replacement as number one, if folks are okay with that. Okay, that sounds yeah. like a good plan. The second one, the Birchland Park carpet replacement. And then the third one, the Meadowbrook parking lot redesign. And fourth, the Maple Shade door. 
And then probably the track resurface as a district wide as number five. Uh, Gordon, uh, the other one I'd uh, ask your advice on would be the uh, facility study. Do we want to, I, I would say we leave it out of the capital requests, but as we've done before, we put the high school as a uh, asterisk portion. I think we can also put the feasibility study as an asterisk portion as well. It's already been discussed. It's not approved by the council, but they certainly have it in the queue, I believe. Yeah, Beth, they, go ahead. They actually have it in the um, capital projects. Uh, that they were discussing in last fiscal year. Yeah. So yeah, right, you could, right. You could separate it out um, just to make sure that, um, which we do in every discussion, to highlight it and then bring it to. It's almost it's individual an individual project outside right. of this. Beth, do you have some? I yeah. I thought that they had approved the feasibility study. Technically, I think it's. What did they in, vote on then? They um, so they tentatively. Um, voted on a series of capital projects for this year. Um, once, I guess they would go back and vote it fully into place. Once the um, Commonwealth has a budget and we know what the town budget will be and the aid that we're receiving. Okay, so they voted that they would vote for it if they get enough money. Correct. Fine. I think what they voted on was to bond it and not keep it, keep it away from because there was some discussion about making it a debt exclusion. Right. And they ultimately decided not to do that and voted to bond it, but to table it until, to Gordon's point, when the budget became more clear of what, how, what direction they were gonna go in. Okay, all right. Yeah, because I remember, you know, just they had kind of sort of said, yeah, that we would bond it or whatever years ago, so, okay. And ultimately, as part of the eligibility period, that's the final piece. So we will probably be in a number of discussions, um, let's say starting January on looking at that. And the reality might be if they're bonding, it, it may be in the next fiscal year, it may not even touch this fiscal year. It won't right. hurt us though, will it? It shouldn't hurt us because right now, um, our timeline is such that um, if we can have the vote with the specific MSBA language somewhere in late April, mm -hmm. um, or you know, if need be, the hope would be late April, that would be the best um, situation, but if need be, we could do it early May. Then once, if that goes through, we send that to the MSBA and then their board would also vote on it and then they would extend us a um, feasibility agreement where basically what the agreement would be looking at um, our accelerated repair as examples that we would then get the reimbursement level that um, East Long Meadow would qualify for. In our last discussion around reimbursement, we were at 56% of eligible costs. And so that's an important key eligible cost because there are elements of the project and the study that would not be considered eligible for reimbursement. So the town would pick those up fully. But 56% of all eligible costs is, is where we are at the, currently. And in the spring, we would have that reestablished to see where we are at that point. All right. Is there any way that maybe we could talk with the council and see exactly when they get their numbers in, that they, as soon as they get their numbers in, make this decision? Because once that decision's made for you, that you got a lot on your plate this year. Once that's been done and they voted on it, it's one less we got to worry about. And if, you know, if we reach out to them now and say, okay, as soon as you know what the budget's going to be, what we do or don't, and, you know, let's not try to push it into February or March, because now you're really, we may find we have something else that's getting in our way at that point. So um, we're, we're working off, a, I, I don't disagree, we're working off of um, the timeline that, of the requirements that I think was in the last packet. For all of we can do more earlier than later. I'm saying if can, we need for them yeah, get can their certainly, part done. You can certainly do earlier. Our thought or my thought was as we're inviting people to be on the building committee, mm -hmm. um, also start into those discussions because many of the town officials would be on um, the building committee if, okay. if they choose to um, take the invitation. Okay. Hmm. 
Okay, uh, back to the capital projects list. We ended at five. Uh, I would continue by recommending number six be Mountain View, new gym floor. Number seven be the Maple Shade Redo, the playground area. And eight be the other Maple Shade asphalt project for the catch basin. I would imagine those two projects would be done simultaneously. And then um, I think the only one left is the other Maple Shade project. Besides the high school, right? Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, yep. Yeah. So roof would be number nine. Maple could shade. We roof. Go for, could we go for accelerated repair on that roof? Um, I can certainly take a look at it. Yeah. Because it's, I think that's accelerated really repair bad. opens um, in January, uh, and the the application process is just that it is accelerated because I think it ends in February. Yeah. I mean, it's worth a shot just to see yes. if it, sure. you know, because it's, you know, like I said, it's a million bucks. It is. Okay, and then we would put, as I said, an asterisk for the high school projects. Those would all be projects potentially picked up by a new um, building project. So we wouldn't specifically ask for them, but we would list them out. Any uh, discussion on the list? And the primary. One more time. Yep. Um, Quick. Sure. So the first one would be the modular classrooms at uh, Mountain View. Mm -hmm. Number two, Birchland Park carpet replacement. Okay. Number three, Meadowbrook parking lot redesign. All right. Number four, Maple Shade exterior door replacement. Okay. Um, five would be the turf, the track, um, the track project. Uh, six, the Mountain View gym floor. Okay. Seven, the Maple sh Shade uh, basketball uh, and uh, play area re asphalt. Okay. Eight, the one underneath it, the Maple Shade parking lot and repaving in the catch basin. Oh, the roof? No, I have a roof. Okay. Not, then nine would be the roof. Okay. The, yep. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Discussion? Okay. Um, I would entertain a vote to submit the prioritized capital request to the town manager as discussed. So moved. Motion made by Beth. <laughs> Second. Second by Sarah. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll pass that on to Mary Gordon. Yep, we'll uh, get that set up uh, in that order and then put the whole thing together for it. Okay. Okay, moving forward, we have a discussion with East Elemental Health and Medical Advisors. Mr. Mackey. Have, have, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think we have Dr. Clark, Ms. LeBombard, and Ms. Petrowski in the audience. We can bring them in. Yep. On their way. Hang on. Thank you. Am I missing anybody? Uh, I think we have all three. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Hi, thanks for having us. Amy, do you want to just start off on an update? Let us know where the town is um, in terms of our COVID cases and such. Sure, I'll give you a little recap over the last three months so it's in perspective for you. I think that um, will help. So in August, we had, uh, this is community-based transmission. So in August, we had four cases of community-based transmission, and one of those was a pediatric case. In September, we had 19 cases of community-based transmission, and one of those was a pediatric case. For the month of October, we had 100 cases of community-based transmission, and 22 of those were pediatric cases. So I think when we got together to talk <clears throat> in August about kind of the state of 
what we could expect uh, in town, you know, as the cold weather moved in and uh, the virus started to uh, surge again. Uh, we kind of thought that this is the direction we would go. I can tell you, I don't, I didn't think we would get where we got as fast as we did. Uh, October was a fast and furious month for our community. Um, I know I was notified that I didn't even know we were getting an alert, the emergency alert that we got tonight in the community. Um, Chief Moore said, sent it to me. Um, so that's the, that's the update for the reports that we get every Thursday. So they, they've moved them from Wednesdays to Thursdays now. Um, so three weeks ago, the state reported that we had 21 active cases. Um, last week, the report listed 43 active cases. And my um, estimation for this Thursday's report is 65 active cases. So it, we have uh, tripled from three weeks ago, uh, which is also con uh, considerable. I will say from, uh, at least from my experience, and Dr. Clark can speak to hers, the turnaround time on the test has gotten remarkably better. Uh, people are using the PCR test, which is the gold standard and the most accurate. Um, almost all of the tests that I get is PCR. And if you go to a, what I'm seeing is if a stop the spread site is used, we can get results within 48 hours, sometimes even sooner. Um, some of the walk-in labs um, and clinics are a little bit longer, three or four days. But I would say for the most part, East Long Meadow is caught up to the state average in about two to three days. And we send out, um, unfortunately, I've had to send out letters to different school communities over the last few weeks, um, just letting people know that, um, you know, we may have had a positive. And um, on that letter, and I think what I'll do is add this link to our website, um, there, there's a link to the stop the spread or all the testing sites. And so someone, all they have to do is put in their zip code and it provides you with a list of possible testing sites um, I think most of which are stopped to spread, but there are others in there as well. Dr. Clark, are you seeing a lot of activity in the pediatric area? And um, are you experiencing the same uh, test turnaround time, uh, about 48 hours or so? Yes, with just as what Amy was saying, we've had an uptake in our office, um, whereas over the summer and into early fall, there were very few positive cases. Um, probably we can count them on one hand. We're probably getting two to three per week. Um, and last week we had five positive cases. So that's a significant amount for our office. Only four providers. Um, the other thing is the test um, testing results are definitely 24 to 48 hours, which is um, exceptional, I think. Um, the testing sites are outside. So as the weather changes, I think we actually talked to Bay State Reference Lab um, today about what they're planning to do about that because parents are unwilling to take their young children um, and have them exposed to the elements. They're still gonna be testing outside in most of their places that have the um, shelter overhead. But in the inclement blowing rain and snow, um, there's minimal protection. Um, and people will still get out of the car to get that done. Um, the stop the thread that's running in um, Eastville Mall has no shelter. Um, so unless they put up a tent um, that's more secure, you know, they might be coming down as well. So it'll be something we have to watch closely over the next few weeks um, with the weather. Amy, you spoke of some of the pediatric cases. Are, is it fair to say that, as far as we know, there haven't been uh, student to student or staff to student um, direct um, infection within the schools? Are, are we are we able to say that? Yeah. So right now, uh, there is no known transmission from uh, any of the sports teams that are functioning or within the school building. We do have multiple tests pending. So that, that could change um, within the next couple of days. And is it also fair to say that other school districts that are not, or excuse me, are in more or have some in-person to person learning aren't ex, uh, experiencing significant transmission within the schools? Have you seen any data 
along those uh, regards? Um, it's really hard to compare across the school lines because the levels of infection are different in every community. So our community has a really high level of infection per capita. Um, so if we look at other communities that are about the same as us, so we've exceeded Springfield and Holyoke at this point. And those are both two communities that are entirely remote learning as far as I know, Gordon. Is yeah, that I accurate? Think, it is. Yeah. I think so Holyoke I think if we can pick, sorry. oh, sorry, Gordon. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I thought Holyoke may have some of their, um, students with significant and um, complex needs in, but uh, for the most part, they're remote learning. Yeah, so I, in order to accurately compare across um, lines, I would need to look at the communities that have as high as numbers as we do to make that, to give you a fair answer on that, and I just don't have the data. Our, do you have the data then specifically on East Long Meadow? So our uh, infection per capita is high, as you just alluded to. Do we know how that's occurring? Is it, is it, um, House parties? Is it uh, shopping? Is it any? Do we know specifically what's causing the transmission in East Palmetto? One of the challenges that we're experiencing in terms of contact tracing is people are really reluctant to uh, to explain who their close contacts are. So it makes close contact tracing really challenging and hard to um, slow the spread of the virus within our community. Uh, we've seen a lot of people doing their own contact tracing. So like if they're exposed and they're a positive. Uh, when they're contacted or we call and try to uh, talk to them, they say, oh, we've, we've let everybody know. Uh, and that makes it hard for us to understand how transmission is occurring. Um, I do know that it's, it's community-based, that none of these cases, uh, none of those 100 cases are long-term care facility-based, which is a dramatically different than what we, ex we saw before, and we've talked about that. Um, so without that really strong level of contact tracing, it's hard to narrow it down. Uh, the governor spoke today and said a large part of it is uh, people who are gathering inside houses. You know, we've have seen this increase with the cooler weather. So, um, uh, but I don't have that data specifically for East Long Meadow. So along those same lines, uh, you spoke of the governor. Um, I think we all have to recognize that COVID is here to, to for a, an extended period of time, potentially into next fall, even into next winter, depending on a vaccine and when we're, um, vaccinated as a population. We have to continue to work as we've been doing it to come back in. The governor stated uh, today that it is uh, community transmission. It's not necessarily the schools. If we continue to see that as a, um, a standard out there, that there's not a lot of transmission in schools, if you maintain six feet social distancing, if you maintain masks fully, um, so as we continue to work on our return to school in school program, those um, are the metrics that we'll continue to look at, the six feet and the mass. But it, uh, my thought is if we're going to look to come back, if we talk about our decision in, in December for January, then is the metric that we're really looking at transmission in schools that are in session between students, between students and staff. And if other schools are able to stay in school because they're not seeing great transmission, then we should attempt to do the same. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, that's a, a decision that the school committee would would make. You know, I don't I don't know what metrics you guys want to set, but I'd, I'd be happy to share what I what knowledge I do have. But the metrics would be you guys. I I think one of the keys, um, and we may get more information on this, is and um, Amy was alluding to it, or not even actually alluding. She just said it very directly <laughs> um, that. It's really about the contact tracing, and um, I, I, we're partnering as closely as we possibly can with Amy's office and with Dr. Clark to uh, make sure, and I can't say enough about um, Kelly and all of our building nurses, because when we're not getting necessarily information fast through the um, contact tracing collaborative, um, often our building nurses are checking in with the families and working with them and we're getting the information that we need, um, thankfully, because um, although I'll probably say this again as we go more into the update, we have about 135 students working in our buildings and uh, um, you know now probably 130 staff members on a daily basis um, and we're not seeing 
the spread right now between student and staff or student to student, but we have had situations where, as I um, stated earlier, where we do have a positive. The positive may have come from something else, you know, from a weekend activity, but then the, the individual, uh, we get that information and we go quickly um, to make sure that we're keeping people as safe as possible. But the key is having that information and working so closely together um, to, to make these decisions and keep people safe. I like to make it, if I could make a big deal is for people to mask when they're meeting within homes. I think, you know, there are recommendations for, you know, not meeting within a home, but if there's a small group, I think we should mask. You cannot assume that because your friend looks healthy, that they are healthy. Um, and that is what is going to stop our community spread as, as well as the contact tracing. And eventually whatever is community spread is going to hit the schools. Um, I think we're making a very good effort with our metrics and our seating and stuff like that to keep the kids safe and to keep the workers safe. Um, but it's going to start with what's in our community. And as the doors have closed, the windows have closed and people have gone inside, our numbers have escalated, you know, five, five fold or three fold. I can't remember which number um, Amy said. Um, Greg, I just wanted to mention that um, one, one comment is that is I know I personally work in a school and um, we've had a couple of teachers who've taken a couple weeks off. And although I wasn't labeled as somebody that necessarily was part of the, a, a cohort that they were close enough to, I didn't have that full 15 minute time frame. I was around those people. I have no problem driving to the Eastfield Mall. It costs me nothing. I sit in my car. I listen to the radio. They do everything. I don't have to get out. And I know within 24 hours and if, if on the off chance, you know, they say it's 15 minutes of continuous, you know, little bits during the time, I'll know if that moment number six minute was the marker for me. And I think it's okay for people to feel comfortable going and getting that done. There shouldn't be a stigma to it. Nobody should be afraid to get it done. Um, and I, I just hope that people do that because if it just takes, it just keeps you safe. And I guess the other question I had for the medical staff is, these 65 cases that we have right now, are they serious cases or are we finding that the cases as they're coming in uh, maybe aren't as serious or is it just the age range or, or like what are they seeing, I guess? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that and I also want to speak one second to the going to the East Vale Mall when mm -hmm. you may or may not be exposed. I think you're absolutely right. There should be no stigma attached and getting tested when there's any doubt is important. Um, Waiting five days post that exposure is what's going to give you the most accurate results. So a lot of times, a lot of fear around, oh my goodness, I was exposed to someone. But it's not until that five-day mark that you have enough viral load in your system to actually show positive on a test. So people find out on Monday they were exposed on Sunday, they run out and get tested, and then, you know, they show negative and they have this false sense of like, oh, I'm all right, I'm negative, I wasn't exposed. But if they went four days later, the, t the virus in their system has amplified to a point where it would show positive. So test, test anytime there's a concern, it is free, um, and, uh, but wait that five days post exposure so you get the most accurate results. The second thing is if you are um, a close contact, it's really important that after you get that test that you treat yourself as though you are infected. I had a couple parents call me this weekend, their children were exposed, and um, what I said is, to protect everybody else in the house, treat them as though they are infected. Put them in a room, isolate them, and that way if the test does come back, you've already done everything you need to do to protect everybody else in that house. So if you are identified as a close contact, it's important not to just continue to go out and live your life while you wait for those results because every day that you're out and about waiting for those results, you're exposing more people. So that's my little plug for uh, testing. Oh, that's good. Okay. I should have said that. I didn't like it. reiterate. I wait a few days before I go, but yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, no, I don't, I'm not saying it just for you. You guys get a yeah. larger audience than the Board of Health meetings do, so I'm yeah. using the opportunity. Yeah, no, that's good. It's good. It's true. Okay. And you did have a question for me, so can you t remind me what that was? What are, what are the cases looking like? You know, we've had a total oh, right. of, you know, like over about 120, 130 cases. Are they... Obviously, because they're not in nursing homes, I'm hoping they're less severe either way, but what are they looking at severity-wise? Are people just kind of 
We have had um, some deaths in our community. Um, let me see. I don't have um, the community members who have passed away by date. I apologize. So I don't know how many have been more recent. Um, but it is happening and we shouldn't be complacent, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Correct. Yeah. So the governor uh, spoke to this today as well. We, we are seeing, because the age range of the people being infected are younger, there are less, uh, there's less mortality associated with it. But the problem right now isn't the mortality. A lot of what you hear on the news is like, oh, there's 99.7 success rate with recovering from this. But that's not really what the concern is. The concern is how easily this virus spreads and how you know we may act one way and then have no idea that we're exposed and then we're infecting people who are older or immunocompromised or have underlying health conditions so by acting as though we all are immunocompromised we're protecting those in our community who actually are and dr clark you may have a much more um medical way to explain that than i did <laughs> well i think it's just with anything else is um, we got to protect the weakest amongst us. And so we really want to be careful with um, how we're taking care of ourselves. The other thing I want to say is that I'm also seeing those um, teens that were affected late September and early October, they did not get 100% well, very, you know, they are still struggling with some respiratory problems. A lot of them now have what we're calling asthma or reactive airway disease. And so it's not just that they're 100% better just like that. And at least two um, athletes that I have are un still unable to participate um, in their sports. They're seeing the pulmonologist and we're just gonna give them time to heal. So, and they had no pre-existing conditions. So, you know, in fact, I thought one of them was more anxiety about the disease than anything, but her pulmonary function tests are bad. So um, we don't know who it's going to hit badly. And it might be a, a teen, it might be a six-year-old. Um, the pediatric ICU at Bay State does have kids in it with um, COVID. So it's not like it's not affecting pediatric cases. Um, we, it's just not in the higher, higher rate that we see it in the elderly population. Would it be accurate to say that um um, the zero to 18 range, there are more cases that are asymptomatic. And so therefore we're not even aware of them. Um, yeah. Or is that? Um, That's definitely correct. It is correct. Okay. So the, the key then, and I think um, Amy said it, you've hit it. Um, and I think uh, Greg hit it as well is the, the masks being on. Um, all of us right now obviously are isolated. So we're unmasked. Um, but the key in schools and anywhere else is uh, we have to get used to wearing masks as we socialize and as we and, and to a certain extent um, making sure they were keeping distance. Um, that, and it's sad because it's changing a lot of our lifestyles, but um, it seems to be that's the way we protect people and ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing we, we should look for in December is the availability of the rapid tests and how quickly the test results can come back so that we can contact trace and isolate um, quickly so that we can keep things as much at bay as possible. And hopefully that continues to improve. Uh, we certainly mentioned it to the commissioner that that was one of the things we were looking for uh, was more rapid testing here in Western Mass. We hope that continues. Um, so we'll look at that too. I think, Craig, sorry not to interrupt you, but if our community, especially with the schools uh, or the sports, being able to share those contacts really give us the tools to protect the students or the teachers that are in the school. That is really the crucial step here. So if we are able to identify those cl close contacts and remove them, it allows everyone who's not a close contact to continue functioning in their athletics or their academics. So that really is a, is a critical piece. And no one gets in trouble. I, I know it's hard sometimes to have the CTC or myself calling, um, but that is really the way we're gonna get kids back in school is by properly contact tracing and properly keeping people isolated and quarantined who need to be. I was just gonna add, and Amy, you kind of took my thunder, but that's fine. Um, the importance of contact, contact tracing and the public needs to realize 
that the way to slow the spread of this disease is through contact tracing. And it's just to emphasize how important it is going forward. Yep. But I think to Greg's earlier point that the virus is here and it, it is here for the foreseeable future, but some of the some of the concerns we had when we began this conversation in August around testing turnaround, that's moving in a positive direction. Even though um, we have a high rate of spread right now in our community, some of the things that we were concerned about are trending in a positive fashion, like the testing, um, like the trial that's happening with having almost 140 students in our buildings and not necessarily at this given moment in time, being able to trace any of that spread back to one of our buildings or one of the one of the athletic teams that's going on. So, you know, I hear Greg's point and I do think that some of the things that were of concern um, back in August when we initially made our decision um, are trending in a really positive fashion. And that part of that work going forward is going to be the ability of the schools to lean on the capacity of the community to adhere to the work that we need to do. If we, if we want our schools open, it's not just gonna be a school decision. We might make the decision, but to keep them open is gonna be a community effort. Mm -hmm. And really okay. starting to think about that now, so that as we approach January, we're putting those measures in place beyond the school buildings, beyond that brick and mortar, and actualizing them within our entire community so that our students are getting what they need, which is a return to school. Mm -hmm. It's just everybody's gotta behave. <laughs> okay, any other questions for our health folks this evening? Um, just one mention, just a plug for get your flu shot. If you, that's something that uh, we all, I have my, I got mine over the weekend. So mm -hmm. that will help as we enter into flu season so that we're protected hopefully against the flu and we know what we need to do to protect ourselves um, and others against COVID. Gordon, as a um, reminder, ooh, sorry, Amy, no, for families, what, what type of documentation will families need to produce by the end of this year for kids to return to school? So I think most, um, most places uh, will give you some type of receipt that you received a flu shot on X date, and that's all we need is a copy of that. Perfect. Thank you. I got mine from CVS, so I can bring it in. I'll share it with Kelly. <laughs> I was going to give a quick plug to all your school nurses. They've been fantastic. You know, in one way or another, I've had to work with each of them. Uh, and it's been exceptional. And the, the cooperation and collaboration that we have has allowed us, I think, to serve the students and the families of East Long Meadow in the best way possible. So, uh, Kelly, your, your team is doing a fantastic job. And they are exceptional. And thank you for saying that. Um, I know with the few situations that were a little bit more comprehensive in nature, without them, we would not have moved through and probably been as um, well situated in terms of contacting families and so forth. Um, and so I think that helped prevent further risk. Absolutely. Right. And I think with the small numbers that we have both in person and in athletics, it's been a good opportunity for us to work through these things and do the contact tracing within the school. And it seems like um, the staff's got a pretty good grasp of it, at least so far. And that'll be good as more students come back in. So, Okay. Anything else for our health professionals this evening? No. Thank you all for your time you. and all your efforts. Um, tonight and other times. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, and, and we continue to work with our health professionals. Um, Gordon and I tend to meet with them at least once a week uh, to get updates and their thoughts as we move forward. And we certainly appreciate all the effort they bring forward with their knowledge and their assistance in helping us um, keep our kids uh, safe and help us understand uh, this complex issue. So thankful for their, their time. Okay, and with that, we're gonna move right into just an update on our, on our uh, learning model. Gordon, you wanna kick that off a little bit? Sure, sure, and uh, Mrs. Brown is gonna also join in as we get going here. Um, I, I know that uh, the, in your packet, it's sort of set up in one way, but I think I'm gonna organize at least the public presentation um, talking about first our remote learning 
program and then go to um, what we have going on and have uh, alluded to a few times as we were talking with our health and medical folks, um, the in-person learning and then ongoing planning. Um, so as all of you know, um, on August 6th, we did decide to uh, start the school year with um, a predominantly remote learning model. Um, and so currently we have about um, 94 0.5 or so percent of our students in that model, which means we have about 5.5% um, in person coming into the schools. Uh, and that may continue, but um, we'll talk about that in a moment. So with the remote learning, what we were attempting to do, and I think we've achieved, and I can't say um, enough about our staff um, all throughout the buildings, because we have all hands on deck really trying to make this happen, teachers, paras, um, administrators, counselors, and so forth, uh, working to sort of support this model. And I think in other meetings, we've referenced the fact that one of the, the benefits of picking a model um, outside a hybrid, whether it's in person, if you can do that with all the safeguards, or um, all remote, is that your entire district then can focus on that model um, and, and really make it um, something that's robust, and, and I think we're doing that. We looked right away to um, make sure that we're following the school day. So I know in your package, you have it broken out. So in Meadowbrook's day, virtually is 9 a.m. to 3.15 p.m. as it would be when we're in person. Um, Maple Shades day runs about 8.10 to 2.25. Uh, Mountain Views day runs 8.15 to 2.30. And um, Birchland runs 7.35 to 2, and the high school runs 7.25 to 1.45. And that was one of the things that Desi asked us to look at, Desi being the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, you know, everybody experienced the spring. Everybody was new um, to this idea of remote learning. And it was a whole different model at that point because it was – school systems trying to react on the spot and put something together, having the summer and then of course the 10 days of professional development before we started on the 16th really helped us put something um, that we feel is uh, very successful and robust in place. And it's following obviously the curriculum frameworks and the standards. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we're really happy that we're seeing is our attendance continues to be really strong with our students. Um, across the district, we're averaging above 98% attendance, student attendance. Um, Meadowbrook right now is at 97.6%. Maple Shade is at 98.8%. Fountain View at 98.7%. Um, Birchland at 98.5%. And the high school at 98.7%. So the attendance is really strong as we end October and move into November. Um, and we're, we're excited to see that. Right. We're also, where possible, as we're remote, we're trying to keep traditional events to the extent that we can do that. Um, we know that uh, Birchland and the high school have begun doing some of their co-curricular and extracurricular activities. Some of that's virtual. Some, while we still have decent fall weather, not necessarily today, but um, on other days, we've had people out um, at the, outside at the schools, whether it be Birchland or the high school utilizing the fields and so forth to connect. Um, we've also had um, our first ever virtual open houses. Um, Mountain View did it in person and met each teacher and uh, each parent separately, but um, our virtual open houses seem to have gone well. Um, I was hoping to give you attendance on those, but that's um, harder to grab, I found, um, because it would be each individual teacher would have to report the uh, attendance. Um, but from what we can gather, we were averaging somewhere around 80%, um, 70 to 80% attendance in terms of the virtual open house parents um, connecting with their teachers, their children's teachers, and kind of getting a look at what does um, the Google Classroom look like and mean and what does Google Meets. Um, it's similar to what we're doing here on Zoom, but obviously each um, format is a little bit different and we're using Google Meets um, and really the Google tools because we're also using Google Classroom as a way to manage our, our learning 
program. Um, and so that seems to be working well. Then um, as we're thinking of how do we expand, one of the things that we're working on um, and have already in place, we started with some students, uh, mostly students with significant and complex needs on September 16th, the very first day of school, coming in to the school. And we do have staff and we do have um, students coming in. We're up to about 135 students right now. And in each of our buildings, we have um, what the state refers to as multiple tiered student support teams. Really, if you put it succinctly, they're, they're student assistants or um, yeah, student assistance teams is probably the best way to think about it. <clears throat> and so they're looking individually now at data and looking at now that we're um, closing in on two months, how are specific students engaging with the remote learning? And off of that, there might be an invitation or work with a family to start bringing in students. I know that um, Birchland last week brought in some more students um, and I believe the high school is looking to do the same and that's coming from their MTSS teams. So there is a slow expansion, if you will, to more in-person learning going on as we continue with remote learning. And with that, um, I know that Mrs. Brown wanted to talk a little bit more about how we're training and working with the MTSS teams, but also um, we recently sent out a survey really figure out because a big piece of everything that we're doing is where are our students socially and emotionally so that they can continue to engage and participate at a really high level. So yes, so with our um, Panorama dashboard, uh, we have the ability to utilize their surveys, which were created by folks who create surveys for a living. So they are valid and reliable and uh, sent them out to our third through 12th grade students. Um, for the kindergarten through second grade, um, this, this surveys aren't really developmentally appropriate. So there are teacher perception surveys. All the while just to get this information about student well-being as one more piece of information on these MTSS teams. And as Mr. Smith said, looking at attendance, um, calling home if, if children are, 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 are missing to find out what the barriers might be. Um, and looking at the social emotional um, well-being of kids to see if they need any other assistance um, and um, academic data as well, how they're doing in classes. Uh, we just did an iReady uh, universal screener for reading and math for grades first through eighth grade. Um, so looking at that and um, beyond the MTSS teams, coaches and um, myself, because we don't have a uh, literacy coach at the moment for third through fifth grade. I've been meeting individually with teachers to look at their iReady data, their STMath data, their RAS kids or whatever literacy that they're using to try to really pinpoint what gaps um, they're facing in their classroom and to plan accordingly. So that's, that's a big part of, um, I know that there was concern, not just in East Long Meadow, but um, certainly across the Commonwealth uh, that, you know, we, we knew that the spring um, from basically March 15th on was different for all families and students and that there would be learning gaps. And so we're using, you, uh, excuse me, we're using a lot of these diagnostic tools to pinpoint exactly where they are and trying to put some individual support plans together. And um, that's something that um, each building is working to do panorama this is the first time we've used that and it's allowed us to get this information to all people who really want to look at it the teachers um, counselors administrators and so forth um, quickly and in depth we've never had it all put together like that where a program's pulling it from the various areas um, that it you know exists such as our student information system it pulls it and puts it together so that it's um, a much easier way to look at this and have a meeting and look at a bunch of different data points. Um, and so that, uh, but, just a quick comment, if you don't mind. Yeah. Did we find that the kids were, we knew that there'd be a gap, but did we find that there, about the gap we thought, do we think it's worse? Do we think it's better? You know, are they like, 
how are they? <laughs> like, did we really mess them up last spring or are we finding that it, they did pretty good, they held their own? I guess I'm just curious. Sure. So, um, the little ones, you know, the littles, I'm sorry. Well, we, I mean, one of the things that we do have a, a look at is um, iReady spans um, my right K to eight. First grade through eighth grade. First grade through eighth grade. I mess that up all the time when I include the kindergartners in it. Um, and so we're seeing that, I want to say, um, and I don't have the data right in front of me, but we're seeing that, yeah, there are gaps. Um, interestingly enough, I think we were a little bit, am I right, Mr. Brown, stronger um, from an aggregate in math at the moment. Um, and we were lagging behind a little bit in reading. Uh, and this is aggregate. This is big picture looking at all. Slightly higher in math, yes. Um, so that, that was interesting for us to look at because math has been something on which uh, we've had a great deal of focus, especially at the elementary level, um, moving into the middle level. Um, but you, you have to break it down further. I'm talking aggregate. And so it's mm -hmm. really important that they start to look at not only their own classroom data, but maybe grade level data and look across what should we be emphasizing and utilizing um, as we continue to plan lessons and units. Um, and so that's what um, Mrs. Brown and some of the coaches are doing in terms of meeting with teachers and helping them break that down further. Okay. But I, but I think to that point, at, as we continue to engage in the conversation around reopening, that both the iReady data and the panorama survey data from the students in grades three to 12, that represents in part the voice of the students. And I think we need to be tuning into that as we're making our decisions regarding reopening and how we reopen. So I think at the next meeting, we should be looking at that data, um, not only in the aggregate, but by school, because that could also inform decision-making processes in regards to who comes back when, based on what we're seeing in trends in student data. And also thinking about from a social and emotional perspective, where are we hearing from kids this call to be back? Um, and where are the pockets or, or sub subsets of our population that are finding remote learning okay. Um, and that those would be some data points that we should also be looking at as we continue to move forward with the planning for um, the potential reopening of schools. So can that be data that we look at at the next meeting? Yeah, I think we can put that together. Okay. Um, and w schools are open, transitioning to more, more in-person learning. More in-person, thank okay. you, Gordon. You're right. That is a fallacy out there that we need to dispel. Our schools are open and are servicing nearly 140 students. Five days a week, full time. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and we are looking to expand that. And, um, and that's, a, I guess, a good segue. And so I didn't mean to throw it out there um, as sort of a conversation stopper, but just a, a segue. Um, when we were working through this summer and guidance from DESE initially started around June 25th and, and came almost every week thereafter. Um, and each week we were looking to figure out, okay, what more has been said? Has anything changed? How do we put this together? We had um, four groups working on that. We had obviously um, leadership team, we had a medical group and an operations group. Um, we had an instructional group and then we also had um, if you will sort of the longer range planning group that pulled in um, representatives from um, the different unions so that we could look at as we look at the longer range not you know, next week but where will we have um, challenges in terms of how our contracts are written and what we may need to look at uh, and those groups were exceptional uh, we um, could not have put together the plans we put together that we gave to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, on August 10th without those groups. And we're currently still utilizing those groups, which um, I don't think, and, and um, we wanna make sure that we're getting this out to all of our families, that, but I don't think we've been sort of publicizing that as much as maybe we should. And so you saw Dr. Clark, Ms. LaBombard, uh, Ms. Petrowski, those basically make up, uh, those individuals have been so helpful and make up a large portion of what we've come to call sort of our health and medical advisory committee. And I think Mr. Thompson said earlier, 
you know, we've been meeting pretty regularly um, over the last six weeks. We've had five different subgroup meetings in addition to their appearances at the school committee level. And we're trying to figure out, um, you know, the Massachusetts weekly COVID public health report because that's a metric, obviously, that the governor and commissioner wanted us to use, but then in subsequent weeks changed how we should be looking at it. And so that's, that can be challenging. Um, and so I think certainly what Mr. Thompson said earlier, kind of breaking it down to the extent we can and look at, is there transmission going on in our school structured activities? And if not, then certainly, you know, let's start to look at the expansion. Um, and, and so we'll continue to work with them because I think it's really important. Um, the information that they're bringing, not necessarily in, this, in a school committee meeting where we're giving you more of the larger numbers, but just the data, sort of the day-to-day -day data that they're dealing with, um, one who has a pediatric practice in town, and then the other one who's our director of public health, um, that's helpful for us to know as we continue to plan in schools. Um, we also worked through with our leadership team, either as a full leadership team, which is about 12 um, individuals, um, or parts of it working, say, with Ryan Quimby, the director of um, our IT department. And our IT department, I do have to say again, and I've said other times, they've been exceptional. Um, in the two week period that um, led up to the start of school, they closed close to 700, it's gonna be a little higher. I think it was a little lower than 750, but it was over 700 um, IT help tickets, if you will. And while they were closing those individual IT help, and anyone who has um, an East Palmetto MA address can put in an IT help um, ticket, they also were distributing um, different mobile devices, whether it be an iPad or a Chromebook, uh, and, that was all going on in that uh, really three weeks up to it, but those final two weeks were um, just incredible. And so we've been working on that um, uh, during late August and September, we were also problem solving with our families around internet connection. Uh, and ultimately, although we were working with Spectrum and trying to be the sort of the intermediary between um, the spectrum or the cable company and families, we eventually switched and we've been working um, and getting hotspots for families that are having trouble um, connecting to the internet and working out that individually. Now, as we move away from sort of the purchase of hotspots, our MTSS teams are picking up that piece as well. Um, so the leadership team is, continues to work at these uh, and there, um, this planning group that I talked about where we have the union officers with us, that's continuing just in the last few weeks. We've had four meetings. We have one this week. Um, and that's going to be really helpful in looking at how do we transition back because we're talking with the actual practitioners who are working with our students now in a predominantly remote setting and what does it look like to expand um, that in-person setting. Um, so these groups are meeting and uh, really are vital. And then the final group is the group right here. Uh, we have to bring this information to all of you um, and have substantive discussions so that we can make good decisions. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And um, this is truly has a great point. Bringing that data is another way of saying it. I like the way you said that, that that's a, a student, a way of presenting the student voice. Um, I haven't heard that in data, so that's pretty cool. Um, so, that's kind of where we are in terms of an update. We have scheduled meetings, as I said, with um, the, this long range planning group, and that's gonna be crucial, uh, as well as the leadership team in terms of figuring out these next steps. Uh, what, what can it look like if you expand in-person learning? Um, it will also help us put together any type of communication and survey um, that we wanna get out to families, because I think it's the point's been made a few times, we need to make sure that the survey is understood um, and what we're asking makes sense so that our families can answer and provide us the information that we need to put the best plans in place. 
And Gordon, I think that's a good segue as we talk about going forward now. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge how well the staff has been um, exceeding expectations in terms of remote learning. We've certainly asked a lot of them to come up with a whole new way of teaching. Um, the feedback that I'm getting, and certainly with my own kids, is that it's going well. It's not ideal. We certainly recognize that, but we know that the staff is working hard. They're working long hours. Um, you know, we hear of them <clears throat> pick, uh, talking to teachers or class or, um, students during some of their prep times and, and really making the most of it and, and helping the whole East Long Middle community. So just wanted to recognize all the work that the staff's been doing and, and certainly our administrators uh, in support of them as well. But as we look forward uh, with that questionnaire, and we'll probably look for a questionnaire towards the end of this month, what we're going to be looking for is similar to what we asked last time is if um, we are able to figure, uh, come back uh, more in person, then would you be willing to send your student? Uh, that may look like a hybrid model. That may look like a, um, a five day a week model. Um, it's going to depend on several things, including the situation on the ground. Um, I think as we get to December, as I said before, we're going to look to how other school districts are doing that are in person and what is the transmission factor in terms of student to student or student to staff within schools. If those numbers are low as they are now, even though we're in the red and as the governor said, then that's not really our metric that we look for, the red uh, portion of it. It's more the transmission. So if transmission is low, then I think we have the obligation um, to figure out which way we can have more students come in. Um, that may be a decision we can make in December. As I said, if numbers are skyrocketed and we see other school districts closing, um, then we may wait a month or two from that point as well. But uh, I want folks to understand that we are working towards getting more students in. We have a fully vetted um, hybrid plan, plan that seems to be ready to go at all levels. The full in-person model is um, getting put together as well. As I said, uh, to maintain the six foot distance in a full in-person model, we would need a considerable opt-out percentage. Um, and, and we would work towards that as we get closer towards that date, meaning uh, we can't fit everyone in the school. So if, if everybody wants to come back, then we, we would be more apt to do a hybrid if enough of uh, the percentage of students are willing to opt out and we will talk about more about that opt out uh, program what that might look like um, then we would have enough room to say get 70 to 75 percent of the students in on a full option so if we're able to do that um, personally i think that would be um, an optimal way to go but again it would depend on participation so we're going to ask for folks families to start thinking about that uh, that if we're able to come back say in a january time frame or shortly thereafter would you commit to sending your student back? And uh, certainly we'll provide a good program for those that opt out and wish not to come back. And certainly a good program for those that wish to, if we're able to. So that's basically where we're at. We're still on the same time frame. It's coming up quickly. We're in November already. So uh, as I said, we'll look to get that questionnaire out at the end of this month. And then uh, next month, talk about whether it's foreseeable for us to uh, get back in and one of the two options to get more students in person. Yeah, Beth. I just think that, and although nothing's set in stone, we're hoping that if it, it does become full uh, remote for some students, if they opt out from coming in, that we're hoping to use Esong Meadow um, staff and teachers to educate the kids, you know, that we don't know anything yet, but that would be our goal. And that's part of what we're discussing with that long range planning group, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to maintain, because I know that was a question uh, back in August or earlier in July that, um, well, what does that look like? Well, I still have my teacher. And so mm -hmm. that's what we have to start to plan through. Um, one thing that's in your packet, but I, I think it's worth mentioning publicly, um, and it's not a necessarily a public document. It's just something that um, all districts are reporting into. Um, it's a new way for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to um, pull in their attendance and then get their their data, so to speak, on what instructional models. Um, but given all the publicity uh, that the commissioner has given us lately um, in East Longmeadow, uh, I did find it interesting that, uh, and I only have from October 9th, uh, because this, they were still uh, 
providing webinars to districts as to how we report our attendance. And so this was off of one of the webinars. When you sort the districts and or charter schools by percentage of their population remote, I did find it on October 9th to be quite interesting that we were 79th, that um, there were 78 districts and or charter schools who had a higher percentage of um, students in a remote instructional model. Um, and so that's, that was at least heartening to me to know that, um, okay, we're not out there by ourselves. It's not uh, just Watertown and East Longmeadow who are in a remote instructional model. It's actually um, a number of districts. And I think a few since then have been added, um, such as the Boston Public Schools uh, just went to a remote, fully remote model. Um, so anyway, that, um, that was information I thought that was important for all of you to know and probably for our parents to know that as we work towards more in-person learning, um, there were a number of districts that were very similar to us who made a choice to start with a predominantly remote instructional model. Um, and in some cases did not start with any in-person learning in terms of uh, starting with students with significant and complex needs uh, as we did on September 16th and started to increase that on a student by student basis as we work with students and families. Um, so hopefully that at some point that's a spreadsheet that actually is public. Um, you know, Desi puts it on their website because it's, it's all the attendance that they're pulling in mm -hmm. from the district and then it, it puts these documents together. Sorry. Can I ask Beth, I think, yeah, just uh, Beth, I think to your point, I think the staff has set uh, uh, the, buy, the bar high in terms of our remote program. And so we would ask that they continue to do that with those opt out students if we do bring some in fully. It's asking a lot and we completely understand it, but we know that the staff is, is up for that. And so uh, I, would, I would echo your thought that it has to be a quality opt out program. Right. Yep. Tara, go ahead. Um, just a question. I know we've, I know um, Ms. Blair has talked about it at previous meetings in terms of um, our budget and how we've been able to expend the funds that have been made available to us either via the state or our, or our budget. Um, and just wanted to double check that we're still feeling like we've made the appropriate purchases and that our staff that is in the building and our students that are in the building have what they need and that there haven't been any additional requests that we now need to fulfill based on having nearly 140 students in our buildings um, currently. Um, just want to check in from the budgeting standpoint that we're still feeling that we're, we've got what we need to potentially increase or expand the number of students coming into our buildings, but also that there haven't been requests coming our way um, based on actually having kids in the buildings. Let me go ahead and answer that one, Gordon. So um, I feel very confident to say that we have been on top of the PPE and working collaboratively with um, both Dr. Welch for student services and uh, you know making sure that uh, her uh, students that are in the building and um, any staff that are in the building that everyone has what, what we need um, with the grant funds, we've worked um, internally here, Mrs. Brown, um, Mr. Smith and myself working with the leadership team to make sure that all the schools have everything that, that we need. Um, I think we budgeted really, um, really well. Um, we still have some funds remaining in the CDRF grant, not a ton of money, but so what, what I've been doing this last week was reaching out to the principals to kind of say, okay, so here we are, we've got some students in, what what do we need? Do you, you know, let, let's look at everything. And so I'm getting some of those responses back now. Not many because I, I like I said, I feel very confident that we've um, we've gotten everything that that we need. Um, we have not used any of the uh, ESSER funds yet. That's a smaller grant. Um, the reason we use the CDRF grant, just to remind everyone, is that that grant ends December 30th. So all those funds have to be obligated. Um, so the ESSER uh, grant, like I said, is a smaller grant, but that, that one can go out, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. Smith. I think it's September of <clears throat> 2022. So not knowing, is that correct? Yeah. It is, yeah. We can so not knowing what the future brings for us and where we're going to be, you know, in three months, six months, or even a year from now, we're kind of trying our best not to utilize those funds. Um, so I, I feel very confident where we're at right now. The nice thing um, was, at least during those 10 days, we were on pins and needles a little bit because we had so many things on back order. 
but mm -hmm. uh, that stuff did arrive finally, thankfully, and um, we've been able to distribute it and um, train how to use the various uh, items of protective, personal protective equipment. Perfect. Thank you. I just think it's good for the the public to to know that we are also considering the financial. Um, cost of reopening or expanding rather the opening of our schools and to know that we have strategically used specific grants to ensure that we can um, cover what we need to cover and, and build that build our capacity to have the materials that we need but also have that forward um, thinking to reserve the monies that we can reserve to ensure that we're providing students what they need and staff and um, our custodians and our nurses with what they need as they um, as we expand our reopening in the future. Yes, and as Mr. Smith said, um, just to remind everyone, we started buying all this PPE back in April and May, and most of it was seriously on back order, and we weren't even sure if we were going to open in September, we were going to have those supplies here. Many came in September, some didn't come till October. Um, we still have a few things, if you can believe it, uh, on back order, but it's very few. And just going through all the buildings as we've done in the last uh, two weeks, um, Sarah, the custodians certainly feel they have the necessary cleaning equipment and the, the training that they need. Um, there's some minor things that some of the buildings still need. Uh, for instance, uh, Meadowbrook was looking for baskets uh, in lieu of cubbies. Uh, so when that when we come back, each individual student would have a basket they could put all other things in. So I just to order. Oh, yeah, just to order. See, you're ahead of me. Yeah, great. So um, yeah, we're in really good shape in terms of being set up. There are plenty of desks. Um, there's plenty of desks still in storage that we've seen um, that we've ordered recently. So we've got we've got the equipment. And it looks like we're ready to go. Um, it's just going to rely on the conditions on the ground. So, and to that point, Greg, I just would like everyone to know that we did place an order back in again. I think that was back in um, May for I say April or May. <laughs> It was 500 deaths and you know we got them in it was going to be the they were delivered the day before school was supposed to originally start um so we felt very proud of ourselves that we partnered with a local company columbia and they worked with us and got us those deaths um so we, we were ready um at that time mrs blair is an incredible negotiator I was listening <laughs> to mm -hmm. because columbia had been they sent their they had that time off too so their whole operations were shut down and so they were just restarting. But uh, Mrs. Blair would take none of that and said, we need these by September 16th. <laughs> so thank you, Columbia. <laughs> and I think the only other piece that we didn't touch upon tonight, just so that it's out there for the general public too, is that we've also begun conversations with transportation because that's another piece of this puzzle. So making sure that everyone is aware of all the different components that really need to come together behind the scenes in order to be able to present um, the comprehensive plans for, for us as a committee to vote on. And that conversation has also begun, correct? In terms right. of assuring transportation? Well, so the issue with transportation is we, we anticipate from the collaborative having the same amount of buses as last year. That's all they can allocate to us. But the problem with that or the situation with that is that we have to maintain social distancing. So if and when we do come back, then we would stick to the state mandated busing. So for those uh, sixth grade or lower outside of two miles, we would bus and the rest we would not bus. So we anticipate um, lengthy car lines. The administrators are aware of that and we'll help you address uh, some of those issues. We've talked about some options uh, in terms of potentially staggered starts, um, but we'll, we'll um, continue to work on those as we get closer. Thank you. All right, anything else on our learning model update? Again, just a, a quick uh, acknowledgement of, of the staff. Um, I know they're rocking it right now and they continue, will continue to do so. And we may call upon them soon to uh, pivot to another learning model. And, and we uh, have full faith that we can all work together to get, uh, get to the right spot, so. Just, just one more quick point, Greg, to, your, to what you've been saying. Um, I did work the early voting for the town in the past two weeks at Birchland. And I've had a number of people come up to me and say, what a phenomenal job the staff is doing in all five of the buildings, given the circumstances. So it's, it's out there that these guys are working real hard and, and you know, I for one have really appreciated the efforts that they have put forward. So I just want to throw that out there as well. 
Yeah, definitely. Not an ideal situation by any stretch. We understand that a lot of families are struggling with this, um, that everybody's dealing with differently, but uh, so far everyone's doing the best they can. So thank you for those words. Okay, uh, with that, we'll continue uh, in the future to update on the learning model. As I said, we'll get some information out, uh, more information out to parents, uh, and we'll ask that folks start to think about what they is best for their family in terms of as we get closer to sending students back, if they'd be um, interested in sending their student in or not. And if folks will start to think about that, that would be helpful. Okay, let's move right along then. We're moving on to 5.2.1. We have a few donations for the high school. Yeah, so in your packet, you'll see that um, there's a request from Mr. Page, principal of the high school, uh, for you to accept a uh, $300 uh, gift from the Flynn family. They'd like to buy three standard bricks, which is part of that project that happens at the high school. If people are interested, they could go to the website and um, there's information listed there. So the, any additional funds beyond what the bricks cost, the money stays in the gift account um, for future use by the school for the students. So that's the first one. And the second one is from the uh, ELHS faculty the sun, from the Sunshine Fund for one large brick for $175 in memory of Cameron Godet. So again, this, they would like to request that you accept these gifts and they can get, be deposited into the gift account. I move to accept the $300 gift for three bricks uh, for the EL Spartan walkway from the Flynn family, along with $175 from the ELHS faculty for a large brick in, in honor of Cameron Gaudet. Okay, thank you, Beth. Uh, motion's been made. Second. Second by Bill, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero, thank you. Great, get that deposited, thank you. So next um, item, sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there. Um, but I think we do have Dr. Allen in the audience and may wanna pull him in because um, this was a grant application that um, had a number of people working on it. Mrs. Brown and Dr. Allen, I believe took the lead and so they might be able to give some background and context to this. Don, can you pull in? I, I don't know if he's still here. He's there. He's there. Oh, he's an attendee. Right. Sorry about that. May have been trying to hide. Yeah. <laughs> no, I had. I, I was on the wrong list. Thank you, Don. Hi, everybody. Hey, Dr. Allen. Hi. That I've been upgraded to panelist. It's pretty exciting. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, we received, um, I worked with Mrs. Brown and um, Mr. Polk at the high school. We collaborated around a grant put, um, put out by the Nellie May Education Foundation. Um, the three of us sort of started the work and then we wanted a larger group. So we added uh, Mr. Martin from my school, Mr. Page from the high school, and then Ms. Cintron from my school. So by the end, we had a nice group of six of us. Um, two from the high school, three from the middle, and Mrs. Brown from the district. So Nellie May offered this grant. Um, it was actually passed along to me from a parent in the community um, this towards the end of this summer. Um, and when I finally got sort of organized on it, I went to Mrs. Brown and she said she was the one that let me know the high school was working on a proposal as well. So then myself, Mrs. Brown, and Mr. Polk met. Um, and it's an Educators for Black Lives grant by the Nellie May Education Foundation. Um, so we had a couple meetings. We wrote what I thought was a really good grant proposal. But to be honest, I don't know about you, Mrs. Brown, but I, I didn't really know if we'd have any chance at getting it, especially when we asked for $10,000. Um, but we got it for $10,000. Uh, so we were really, really excited. Um, what we ended up, we, we talked about a few different things uh, when we were writing it, but what we ended up going for actually was the one that excited me the most, which was a community speaker series. So we really talked about how we're doing a lot of work in the schools and at the district level in terms of equity and diversity. Um, but it would be very cool to bring the larger community into the conversation and into the thinking. So we proposed a speaker series running from January to June 
which would include three different speakers. Obviously, they'll be virtual unless there's a drastic change in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, we sort of were hoping to go after some bigger ticket people or at least one or two. Um, and then we were hoping to invite um, students, staff, and community members to sort of start a larger conversation around diversity and equity and the black experience in East Longmeadow. Um, so that was the grant we wrote and that was what got approved. Uh, so we're very excited. I'm sure Mrs. Brown can add some stuff here. I think you said it all, but just big shout out to uh, Mr. Polk for sure um, for bringing his story um, into the, the grant. I think that's really what, what made us um, end up getting it. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the Nellie Mae said, you know, um, that they were taking applications from anybody, but they did say that we we're looking for the lived black experience. Um, and Mr. Polk really stepped up and uh, took what was a good grant and made it a very heartfelt grant. And I think that was the final step that was needed to get us the grant. That's great. Okay, can I have a motion to accept the grant, please? Move to accept the Educators for Black Lives Rapid Response Grant awarded to Birchland Park and the East Longmeadow High School in the amount of $10,000. Motion's been made by Bill. Second. second. Second by Antonella. Any discussion? I would just add, I- Sorry. I was gonna say, I think you mentioned that it, it arose from a potentially a, a family but just to say thank you to the family who alerted um, the district yeah. to being able to um, pursue this because um, that would have gone undone potentially. So thank you to that family. Absolutely. Beth, did you have something? No, I was just going to say that was pretty impressive. You know. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Okay. All those in favor of, of accepting the grant, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Aye. That motion carries five to zero. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to say thank you very much. I just want to say one more thing. Um, it was also really cool to see the middle school and the high school work together so seamlessly on the grant. So I thought that was a good uh, secondary focus. So thank you for accepting it. And obviously, we'll be inviting you all once we get organized and get our speakers all uh, scheduled and ready to go. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Allen. Have a good rest of the night. Yeah, you too. Okay. You too. Okay, that's great. Uh, we will move on now to our next order of business. We have the high school building committee discussion. So um, as you remember, last uh, meeting, we began looking at um, the school building committee for not only um, the feasibility study, but this committee would also continue on, hopefully into working together as we look at uh, a comprehensive project. At, uh, okay, so we had talked about um, some school committee members, uh, probably adding two to the committee. Right. Um, we had a few interests, Antonella, Beth, still both interested? Yep. Yep. Okay, so I would just ask that as the committee move forward, if um, that building committee could come to the school committee at three uh, specific times. Uh, the first time, if they could come before it goes out for design, so in terms of um, the wish list. The second time on w the first draft from the architect, and the third time before the final approval of the, um, the drawing or the uh, architectural design. Okay. Is that? Makes sense? Yes. Okay, and if so, then I would be willing to um, to not sit on that committee and uh, focus on getting us through COVID if uh, Antonella and uh, you and, and Beth want to serve on that committee. All right, I'll be happy to. Okay. Yes, me too. Okay, all right. So uh, the rest of the committee we have locked in? Uh, we're working on that. We're gonna be sending out invitations. Um, I've spoken to a number of people um, you know, the different positions that we need to fill. And I will speak to a few more, but I also wanted to send them a more formal invitation. What, what about the thought of a kindergarten parent? Any interest in, or a first grade parent, a Meadowbrook parent, I, I guess we could say, just to get someone who might be in this for the long run? Do we want mm -hmm. to add one more member? 
I don't have any anyone in mind, but I'm just thinking that might be an idea. I can uh, reach out and um, see how we might select someone. Yeah, are folks comfortable with that? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Maybe we could start with their council members. They might know someone. Yeah, or, or even Mrs. Dakin, if she has someone who's might be interested in a, in a long, I mean, because we're looking long term. This is this could be a six, seven year project. So someone might be interested in serving um, to see this thing through fruition. Yeah, it is going to be a long commitment. Yeah. So okay. I'll reach out to Mrs. Dakin if that's uh, what the committee would like. And, you know, maybe we can look at school council and or PTO or both and see. Yeah. That. Yeah, Gordon, why don't you and I work on a name, that final name, and then we'll add that to the list. And then I think we have our, our set uh, committee, correct? Yeah I, yeah, I have to get out the invitations and finalize the different conversations that I've been having informally. But uh, yeah, with the selection of two school committee members, we'll be on our way to completing this. Okay. Just on a paper. And then Everybody's cool with that? Yep. Good. Okay, excellent work. Uh, thank you both for willing to uh, to serve on that committee. Thank you, Greg, too, for, I know you were interested, so. That's all right. I'll be around. I'll be paying attention. I'll be around. Right be around. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move forward then. We have a application to the Mass DCR, Urban Community Forestry Programs Challenge Grant. So this is a, um, a grant that um, the, the Department of Public Works is putting in. And um, should we get this, we would be, if you look uh, in your packet on that final page, it lists where um, certain trees would be planted. And um, they're looking to hit three of our schools, Maple Shade, Meadowbrook, and Mountain View. Uh, and so I had um, endorsed the project uh, that Mr. Fenny was putting together but also wanted to get your endorsement um, to sort of finalize this and then send off the application. So this, there's uh, an extensive amount of plants. It looks like they're planting at each building. Right. Yeah. Uh, maple shade, three October glory, red maples, six sugar maples, Meadowbrook, there are uh, three tulip trees, two black gum, uh, one purple fountain beach and four sugar maples. Some of those trees I'm not even uh, familiar with. I was going to ask you knew what they were. <laughs> yeah, well, some of them could be big. So my is, my question is, um, I know the town has an has a arborist on staff, I believe, in the DPW. They do. Right. Yeah. Warden. We should probably get consultation because some of these can get rather large. So I, we should probably, I'm sure Bruce is working on that. But in terms of placement of these, there's some big trees in here. Right. Okay. All right. I'm good as long as we put those in the right spot. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the uh, the grant work. Move to approve the application to the Mass DCR Urban and Community Forestry Program Programs Challenge Grant. Motion made by Bill. I'll second. Second by Beth. Discussion. I just love it. It's like an Arbor Day that keeps on giving. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. Okay, moving right along. We have a solar energy proposal for Meadowbrook and Mountain View schools. Just some information. Right. So this is uh, information that, um, again, the uh, Department of Public Works have put together with a um, local um, maybe not local, but a solar energy um, company. And it's looking at how uh, we harness flat roofs in um, the area, municipal buildings, in this case, schools, Meadowbrook and Mountain View. Um, and if you read through it, it gives you an idea. Um, they'd be leasing the space on the roof. Um, and it gives you some looks at what it would look like. Uh, to Mr. Thompson's point, certainly this would be, an, uh, if this is something that is of interest to the school committee, I think this would be ongoing discussions. Uh, and certainly we probably want to talk with the person who prepared this uh, proposal, as well as talk with Mr. Fenney. Um, I think one of the keys is that the proposal is looking at Meadowbrook, and we are just finishing up 
um, a roof project through the MSBA Accelerated Repair Program at Meadowbrook. And so I know that we would want to ask very specific questions because there are um, elements in our agreement elements. Um, there are um, articles, I guess, uh, in our agreement with the MSBA that um, we would want to make sure we're not in any way violating because um, that would be a situation where then we would be paying back some of the reimbursement money that the MSBA put into the roof. Um, most most um, apparent is that we have warranties on all items on the roof. And so anything that would impact the warranty from staying in effect would be something the MSBA would be um, very interested in knowing about. So I think this is really interesting, but I do have a lot of questions about it. Similar to what you're saying, um, what if we have a situation like what happened at Maple Shade and there's too much snow, the snow causes an issue with the roof, um, could that be the solar panels? Are, do we pay to have the solar panels removed? Do we lose? Um, will they have insurance on it? So if it's, if it's their fault, um, again, if there's damage to the roof just because of weather, who's in charge of removing those solar panels and putting them back on? Um, the insurance policy that would have to be obviously attached on some level. If, say, for instance, we decide Maple Shade and um, Mountain View have to be, which is a thought too when we're looking at putting on a roof and using the MSBA, what if we want to combine those two schools within the next 20 years? Uh, do we have to follow through with this? If we break our contract, what happens with when we break our contract? I have all kinds of questions. I think it's a great idea. Um, and we do have a brand new roof at Meadowbrook. I mean, you know, so lots of thoughts. Hey, Beth, just one, one quick thought. You know, this might help you a little bit. We have, I have solar panels on my roof and there is absolutely no snow buildup because the solar panels themselves, even with snow on, generate heat and the snow melts right away. Well, I'm not so much concerned about the weight from the solar panels. I'm more concerned about if we have almost like what happened at Maple Shade and, and something the, the yeah. internal nature of the roof goes just because of life, not because of the solar panels. Right. And we have to take them down, we have to put them back up. Who gets hit with that cost? And I think it's just a lot of little questions. I could make a list, you know, but. I think it's a good idea and I think we should certainly address it, but I think I would need to have somebody come in and talk to me about it because these solar companies make a lot of money on this and they're using our roofs and we want to make sure that one, the town gets credit toward using space that's for solar energy that isn't taking over a farm field because I think that's important. I think this is the way to do it um, as opposed to just, you know, but I think we also have to protect ourselves as a, as a community um, and that we know exactly what's happening as we move forward. It's a ways away, but yeah, I get it. Yeah. Especially if we wanted to, you know, and it even goes back to just thinking about using MSBA money for a new roof for either Mountain View or Maple Shade. We have to think about that because in 20 years, within 20 years, we might want to consider consolidating that in. And I say it and I laugh because you know it'll take forever into one biz, one school and how would that affect this too? Well, I mean, that's a good point. It's one I didn't think of um, when we were talking about the capital plan. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to pursue a roof through accelerated repair uh, from the MSBA on Maple Shade, you would have a 20 year um, sort of hiatus, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. moving from that school. So that's something that we should consider, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking within that 20 years of doing some other project, then you might not want to go accelerate repair. Um, because right. the then you're looking at a 70 year old school too. I know I've just hopped over into a whole new right. world. But so you, do have, you do have some things to consider that cross over, but that was, uh, that triggered the thought of their programming. They, the accelerated repair looks out 20 years. Mm -hmm. right. You're utilizing, um, you know, you're in an agreement with the MSBA, then you're basically saying that you will be in the school for 20 more years. Um, which at Meadowbrook, um, certainly all the work we've done there, we're in good shape. Um, yeah. 
but to the point you were making, if you're looking at ever at some point of doing some kind of combining down the road with the two, three through five schools, um, then that's something you need to think about as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's worthwhile looking into and seeing where it goes. Yep. I agree. I think it would be prudent of us to explore it a little bit further and to, to look at, you know, potentially some, some cost savings and, and being able to, um, to support the schools. I think if we're, if we're going to explore it further though, um, that we would want to include some building level leadership too um, at those conversations mm -hmm. to ensure that the principals whose schools would be impacted because I think um, we'd want to also know like, would there be any, any potential interruption to academics based on the work that would be happening. I think we'd want the, the building level leadership to be privy to those conversations. And I mean, I don't know what the timeline needs to be, but maybe we can push this out to after the new year to have them come so that we can kind of handle the, the matters um, in front of us right now being the potential expansion of the schools um, reopening plan. So the other I, thing I, I was thinking too was, um, I lost a thought, wait a minute. Oh, you know, of course, obviously, how, how does it affect the, um, you were saying that the teachers, the, the school actually directly, but I lost my thoughts. I'll think of it and I'll bother with you later, but there was another thought, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we'll, uh, we'll get some more information on this, but yeah. certainly worth the discussion. There would be some cost savings and, um, certainly the way of the future. So uh, we'll find out some more information. There's no big rush on it, but we'll continue to, to look at it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll reach out to Mr. Fenny and just um, see if we can start to put something together for the new year in terms of a larger conversation. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. With that, if no one has any other um, topics they'd like to discuss, uh, we have arrived at the end of our meeting. Um, so I will entertain a, a, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion's been made by Bill. Second. Second by Antonella. Um, certainly want to acknowledge all the work of this committee and uh, the leadership team and all the staff of East Middle Public Schools. Um, good meeting tonight, everyone. And um, all those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That motion carries five to zero. Thank you all and have a good evening. Bye. Thank you very much.